Now we've heard a presentation on the impressive um, late stage production using um, 3D printing and the, the wishes of the, the pharmacists um, in uh, making medicines through 3D printing. I'm going to go back to the other end, which is more the research side and talk about um, how we're helping our customers and our, our clients develop new technologies that might one day allow them to print their own um, pharmaceuticals. So very briefly, um, we're an engineering company based in Switzerland. And since 2007, we have been designing and manufacturing 3D bioprinters for academic and industrial use. So these are really very much built towards printing cells and tissues. However, in the last five years, we've also found that the technologies that are within these instruments also lend themselves to the research side of tablet printing. And I'd like to talk about that more. So the instruments that we currently produce um, for most of our customers are research instruments. And the data that I show later is from these instruments. Now, as I say, we are engineers, so we don't do any of the printing or any of the development work ourselves. Our focus is on generating hardware and software that enables our users to do what they want to do. And obviously, um, within this particular field, if you started off with a, a research study and you find something that is of value, you're then going to look to see how do you then apply that in an industrial application, so some type of fabrication. And for us, we follow our customers or our collaborators from these research tools through to um, fabrication printers. So we've created large scale fabrication printers. You can see a, a print head example where they generate um, 100 batches of 100 um, bone samples um, per hour. And these are high throughput single application printers that are designed for a central production facility. At the other end, um, we've also designed small scale fabrication printers that are designed to be at the point of care um, on demand production in a dental application. And the thing that we find that we need to focus on is not just the hardware, but also the software. As has already been said, uh, we cannot assume that the people that are going to be doing the fabrication are able to um, code or do complex um, software procedures. So we need to find ways to provide common process controls and really easy to use user interfaces. So I think everyone that's in this conference today has common goal. Um, I'm sure we all understand that additive manufacturing technologies um, have the potential to change the way that um, tablets are printed and to um, provide options that are not currently addressed by conventional methods, such as changing um, dissolution rates, increasing drug loads, um, changing the doses or accurate doses um, optimized to different patients, and even polypills, multiple actives with one in, within one single tablet. So obviously there are many components to this that are required, but it is one step towards enabling personalized medicine. I'm sure over the, the next number of talks, we'll also hear many different types of print technology um, from powder bed printing, inkjet, uh, laser sintering, fused deposition. The type of printing technology that um, we focus on is extrusion printing. And we find that extrusion printing provides multiple options for accurate printing. Um, for a lot of the researchers in academia and pharma that we, we help with our instruments, they find that it's able to print um, pastes made of powders plus binding material with a wide range of viscosities. It doesn't necessarily require filament formation. You can print the pastes directly. So that also maybe reduces the need sometimes for higher temperature melting, which can obviously potentially affect the API. 
And also by controlling the type of printing process you use, you can avoid mechanical stress of the API as well. By only printing exactly what you need or want, you can reduce the wastage or use of expensive materials. And it also potentially reduces post-production processing. Because it's very accurate down to very low resolution, it also then enables you to change the geometry, the surface architecture of the tablets that you're printing. And if you need, when you're printing these pastes with various um, additives, you can use UV cross-linking to harden them as well. So what do I mean by um, extrusion? So on the left, um, as one of our printers with a number of different print technologies as, as attached to it. The first um, I'll talk about is melt dispensing or melt extrusion. And that is, as it says, we put something, a thermal polymer, thermoplastic, or filaments into the cartridge that's then heated up to as well, up to 240 degrees and then is printed. And the um, melt dispenser is the, the one with the ridges on the right hand side. It allows you to print materials with very high viscosity. Um, and it also gives you the ability um, to print very fine fibres. This is particularly useful if you're creating a polypill and you want to create some form of scaffold. You can create these chambers using the nanofibers. Next, um, the pneumatic strand dispenser. So again, this is using um, air to extrude material, to extrude the paste which you've created from your powder plus your binder. Again, it's able to print um, viscosity ranges um, up to very high. That really depends on your particle size. So there's a lot of chemistry that comes into optimizing the print and also which print technology to use. The pneumatic dispensers are the, the middle one and the one second from the left, ones with a heated jacket and ones without. Um, obviously, the less temperature you put onto your paste, the better, but obviously some materials will print better at different temperatures, so we can control the temperature of each of the print heads. And that also allows you to control the rheological properties, so that helps you with printing and also reduces the clogging of the nozzle, which obviously can be quite a major issue. The last of the print technologies I talk about is, again, extrusion, but using a piston. And that is the print head that is second from the right. Now, it can print pastes just as well as the others, but where a piston comes in particularly valuable is in printing non-homogeneous um, pastes. So sometimes our customers have found that making a suspension of their particles um, is very difficult to keep it in um, a constant suspension. And so the viscosity can change of that material. And using a high precision syringe pump based dispenser, you can overcome those issues. So you can very carefully control the deposition of these materials that can have very complex and un unpredictable viscosities down to a very small accuracy of print. So those are the print technologies. The other part, as I said, is ease of use. Now, one of the things is the software and we're very well aware of this and we work hard to provide our users with um, precise control, pressure, temperature, speed of printing. Obviously, the faster you print, the more, um, the more products you can make but sometimes you lose um, an accuracy or your material that you're printing starts to become um, more fragile. One of the advantages that we, we find using multiple print technologies is that um, the researchers can select which print technologies they're going to use depending on the materials they're printing. And then they can have multiple print heads, each loaded with a different material. 
Obviously, that's great if you're going to create a multi-material print, but then you have to know that when you change from one print head to the second, that you're going to be able to print exactly where you want. So calibration is also particularly important. Um, needle offset calibration, substrate height calibration. The other important thing is in building your protocol. Obviously, when you're designing and developing a protocol using a, a 3D printer, it can take a long time to optimize because there are so many parameters you can change. In the, our system, in order to try and overcome this, um, we've enabled a system where you can change the conditions, you can change the parameters during a print run. So rather than before you would design your protocol, you'd press start and come back later and see what had printed. Now, during the print process, you can measure all the parameters using um, visual systems and change the parameters. So your first run is a, is a waste, but by the end of the first run, hopefully you've managed to optimize a number of um, the parameters that will be important going forward. The other part to this is, it's all very well saying that we can print multiple materials and obviously making pastes from powders is relatively straightforward. But how do you then load the system? Um, as I said, we're the engineers. We write the code and we build the instruments. We don't actually do the printing. So the data that I'll show comes from a number of our collaborators who've published quite recently. And the University of Nottingham um, printed a, a diagram which is far better than I could have drawn about how they load their printer with their um, API containing paste. So it's very straightforward. They make a mixture. They inject it into the printing cartridge. Um, they then add a nozzle and then just attach it to the printer. And some examples then of um, what our collaborators, our customers have been able to use our instruments for. So the first of these was solving a problem, um, testing out the ability to create high drug loaded um, tablets. As it's a research project, it was using paracetamol, which traditionally presents a challenge that is only possible to get um, 30 to 40 percent active component within a tablet. By using a, um, a paste formulation and using 3D printing with um, pneumatic extrusion at low temperature, they're able to create um, tablets with hydro loading of up to 80%. The physical form of paracetamol um, was not affected by the printing process. They tried a number of different analytical techniques to show that. They found that the formulation as well, um, by changing or controlling the surface geometry, perhaps in the photograph you can see there are um, it's not just a smooth surface to the printed tablet. They were able to get a very high release of the active within a short period of time. And at the end, they were also able to show that they were able to control to within tolerance the weight and dimension of the tablets they printed. The breaking force, the disintegration time was um, very reproducible between print runs and friability was also good. Another collaborator who very recently published um, was Novartis. And here they were using um, the pneumatic dis extruder um, with heat. Now, um, here they were printing caffeine as the drug with um, a matrix and three different formulations. And each of these three formulations were printed in two different infill densities. So that means that there was a, a matrix created with more spaces or less spaces, so 30 and 80 percent. On the right, you can see that um, there were changes between, probably not surprising, there was um, ability to change the dissolution rate of your caffeine tablets, um, depending on not only the formulation, 
but also the infill density. And so here, it was a good example of by changing the surface geometry and the way that the tablet is printed, as opposed to changing the, the structure itself, you were able to control um, the release profile. And by carefully changing or carefully tuning these parameters, you were able to control um, the, the release profile um, very, very accurately. So the last example I'd like to present is back to the, the University of Nottingham. And here they combine um, components from the first and the second studies that I showed. And here they created a multi-compartment tablet. But not only that, that the multi-compartment tablet also had defined release profile. So on the top left, you can see um, the design that they used to build this um, five component tablet, um, five different compartments, five different actives. The main or the core um, lower part was designed for extended release. And the upper part with two other actives was designed for immediate release. And they also printed dots on it, changing, as I said, the surface architecture changes the dissolution rates. The graph on the right shows that they achieved what they wanted to achieve. They got two independently controlled, and well-defined release profiles. The two drugs in the top level were released very quickly, and the three drugs in the lower chamber were released much more slowly. And that the release profile again can be controlled by the um, formulation of the paste that you're using and by the um, surface geometry. So it shows that you can create complex medications, um, particularly where there are multi-tablets multi that need to be taken by one patient, like metabolic or oncology, and that you can put them into one tablet, which can obviously help with compliance, um, and that this can be personalized as well. You can potentially control the amount of active for each of these five compartments. Um, depending on the patient. You can then also change the release profiles of these different actives so the one tablet can then last for potentially all day. And that there are already understandable ways of doing this through um, printed architecture and also differing the paste composition. So there's much more I could say, but I think I just wanted to give a snapshot of what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to support our um, collaborators. Say we are the engineers and we understand that the engineering part is complex, but equally as complex as the formulation. And we're not even trying to address the, um, the other regulatory components at this moment. Um, thank you.